Welcome to our Animal Justice Academy Lunchtime Live. Our topic today is why animal advocates should fight for electoral reform. And we have with us today Green Party leader and political powerhouse Elizabeth May. <laughs> um, I'm Kimberly Carroll. I'm the director of Animal Justice Academy, and I'm happy to have all of you here, um, both live and watching the replay. So um, I've talked a lot in Animal Justice Academy um, about why it's key for making political change for animals in Canada to um, be able to have electoral reform in this country. And in about a week, we have a hope of getting this issue back into the national conversation with a vote in Parliament to create a National Citizens Assembly for electoral reform. And of course, we have a champion for electoral reform here with us, Elizabeth May, leader of the Green Party of Canada, to explain why we, as animal advocates and supporters of democracy should step up to fight for this assembly in the next week. Hello, Elizabeth. Welcome. Hey, Kimberly, and welcome to everyone. I've been just, if you see my eyes flitting over to this side of the screen, I was trying to scan the list of participants and then go over to the chat. And I'm just, I'm going to flag right now. We should probably just turn the whole meeting over to Rob from New Zealand to explain what happens when a country in the Westminster parliamentary democracy tradition, which I sometimes say about our voting system, that we're still going around in Queen Victoria's hand-me-downs and they really don't fit because we vote the way in 1867, yeah. the voting took place in um, in the Commonwealth in, in, in England. Well, fast tracking back to New Zealand, New Zealand is the only country um, within the Commonwealth that kicked out the voting system of first past the post brought in mixed member proportional and as a result has had a, a, a more thriving democracy with more diversity in its parliament. But I think, you know, just to pick a very specific issue for animal justice advocates, if you recall, and I think a lot of us worked on that bill when a liberal Nathaniel Erskine Smith, right after the 2015 election, put forward an excellent, forgive me, I'm forgetting the number of his private members bill, but an excellent comprehensive modernization of our legislation to protect animals and protect against cruelty to animals and stop animals being treated as property. All of that was encompassed in Nate's bill and it got killed before it really it got killed before it ever got to a vote in parliament. Why? Because the what got referred to as the Ag Caucus within the Liberal Party. I, remember, I was so naive. I remember reading about Nate's bill in the Globe and Mail and thinking, oh, this is great because it's a liberal government and this is a liberal MP, so they're all going to be in favor of Nate's bill. Eh. Mm -hmm. So why did, was it possible? for the Ag Caucus within the Liberal Party to kill Nate's bill through amendments that gutted it before we ever got to one vote on it? Yeah. I'd say it's because of the first past the post voting system yeah. and the clout that a couple of ridings can have because it's first past the post. It's not representative. Our voting system distorts what the citizens of this country want, completely distorts it from the government we get. And that's because we don't think much about the way we vote. And I noticed some of you say, I don't really think about this issue much. We elect a parliament based on which MP wins in their own riding, even if they just win by a hair, right? There's some MPs serving in parliament after the 2015 election. I looked at a couple of the Quebecers. They got elected with about 28, 29% of the votes in their riding, which means 70% of the people in those ridings voted for other parties. But all those votes did basically just disappear because the only vote that counts is the vote for the person who won, who got, this is an old racing term from horse racing, got their nose across the finish line ahead of the, the jockey on the horse next to them. Mm -hmm. By the way, I, I did I did a rant once for for one of the TED talks because I looked it up. First past the post as a horse racing rule was eliminated in the 1880s by the Jockey Club because it produced bad results in horse racing. But we <sighs> still use it for how we elect our government. So that's well, a and Elizabeth, rant. that's a great way for us. Uh, another reason for us as animal advocates to throw out first past the post. It's like it represents horse racing. <laughs> yes. Yeah, <laughs> but even horse racing wouldn't have it back in the day. Yes. So fair voting and thank you to everybody here who's a volunteer with Fair Vote Canada. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Michelle, for your work. Fair Vote Canada is such an important nonpartisan citizen education effort. 
But fair voting, which is in most democracies around the world, it's the rare country that is plagued with a voting system that is inherently unfair. But what we fair voting would allow if, you know, 30% of Canadians voted NDP and 15% of Canadians voted Green and make this a realistic one and say 20% voted Conservative, then that's the, that's the representation you would see in the House of Commons. But what we have in Canada is particularly risky because unlike in the United States where they actually have separation of powers between you either vote for president and that's the White House, or you vote in the Congress. But in Canada, as soon as a party leader like Trudeau, if, if they're under this unfair voting system, if they have more MPs than the other parties and they, hit, they have more than 50% of the MPs, you can have what, um, and he just passed away, but he was such a champion for this, the late Peter Russell, Professor Emeritus at U of T, coined the term false majority. So you can have like Harper did in 2006, about 40% of the vote but 100% of the power. Because as soon as a, a leader of a party in our system has the most seats, they control what, what in the US would be separate. They control the executive powers and they control the legislative powers. So whatever is gonna happen in a democracy in Canada, even with a false majority, you don't need to have the majority of the public or even, the, you know, a bare majority, you, didn't have to, you don't even have to have 51% of public support to have 100% of the power. It's very dangerous. And in getting fact, rid Elizabeth, of that voting system is critical. Yeah, and, and in, in fact, um, our majority governments in the last you know, 15, 20 years have all just won by 38, 39% of the vote. So that means 60% of Canadians have not been represented um, in, in, the, in the ruling government. And on the flip side, let's just take a party like the Green Party, who, you know, we've, uh, a Green Party has gotten to like 10% of the vote um, in some cases, which should result in a parliament yeah. of 334, you know, uh, seats, should be 30 something seats. The most the Green Party has had is like three seats at once, yeah. right? Yeah. So it's really hard. It's really hard for smaller parties to get any traction. And it also, of course, it's it's how a party that the new parties that have started up, let's say, I mean, I'm I'm older than most of you guys, but the new parties that have started up that have really got there that have had made serious traction electorally are always regionally based splinter parties. So if you're the Bloc Québécois and you run only candidates in Quebec and your only real issue is Quebec sovereignty, you're, you, you're guaranteed to get a lot of seats. I mean, it's something that, that people outside of Canada find pretty hard to imagine, that a party that's dedicated to breaking up Canada could become the official opposition, which the Bloc Québécois was when, um, when, they, when the first time that, um, that Harper got a majority, the Bloc Québécois was official. So Bloc Québécois can become official opposition because they only run in Quebec, because of first past the post, in the same way that Reform Party, which initially started out only in Alberta, can make tracks fast because the, the, the first past the post rewards divisions and it doesn't encourage cooperation. So that's why one of my favorite political scientists who's looked into this a lot, Professor um, uh, Liebhardt, originally from the Netherlands who works out of California, he's very elderly now, but he's, he's done more wonderful work and he's written extensively on this. But what happens is you end up with, what well, he defines the voting systems, not using terms like first past the post, mixed member proportional. He says, some are winner take all systems, and the others are consensus-based systems. So in a healthy democracy, it's always better if you're operating from a consensus-based system because our system encourages elections where, and everybody knows this in Canada, it's not so much that another party wins the election because they're suddenly popular or their ideas are great. Really what happens is people get sick of the government they've got and you get an election of throw the bums out and then you bring in the next set of bums. And what you get is, what is um, some referred to in the academic literature as policy lurches. So you go from one set of policies, the next set, set of people come in and they say, we're throwing all those out. 
We're going to bring all this new stuff in. So as a result, when in, in uh, Leapart's work, uh, you end up discovering that the most stable uh, democracies, the, the strongest economies, and certainly policies that stick, like climate policies that really stick, come from countries that have fair voting, like Germany, fair voting, like the Scandinavian countries. Most democracies, again, emphasizing this because most Canadians don't know this, most of the world's democracies don't use the system we use. And where you started from today, Kimberly, we will be having a vote in Parliament. We really want to mobilize people. Fair Vote Canada is doing a great job letting people know that um, on, on the first voting day, first Wednesday of February, we will be voting on motion 86 to create a citizens assembly, not moving right away to get rid of first past post, which I would rather, but at least creating an opportunity like a big national jury to look at the issue and conclude what is the best course for Canada. And yes, uh, we should get rid of first past the post as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, it's, it's really, this is, a really exciting thing, even though it's not the whole shebang, because when Justin Trudeau broke his promise in 2017 to mm -hmm. bring in electoral reform, like it died. Like we, th I thought it died. I think a lot of us thought it died. And so this is just uh, an exciting thing that there is at least a chance on a federal level of bringing this back into the conversation. Yes. My well, cat says hello, uh, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it can't. I mean, the thing about it that was so egregious was, of course, that I don't think that Justin Trudeau, I don't think there's good evidence the Liberals wouldn't have won the 2015 election if they had not promised that 2015 was the last election yes, under first exactly. past the post. I mean, I talked to MPs who know they lost their seat because they'd get people coming up to them, like Craig Scott in Toronto Danforth. I mean, heck, mm -hmm. it was Jack Layton's old writing, and Craig is a dear friend, and he's NDP. I still love people, even if they choose the wrong parties. But Craig said to me, he had people coming up to him who were friends, people who'd knocked on doors for him in previous elections, saying, forgive me this one time. Craig, I got to vote liberal this one time so we can get rid of first past the post. The 2015, is the last election under first past the post, it was not only in the liberal platform, they put it straight away into the speech from the throne and they set up the committee on which I served from, oh my goodness, the work we did to have a majority report of MPs from every party in the House to say yes, we have to move to proportional representation. And then the Liberals said, oh no, we don't like that answer, so we're, we're just breaking our promise altogether. It's so, it's, it is, I think, unforgivable, not because it's violating a promise in an election, that happens, unfortunately, but this promise won them the election. And I think for a whole generation of voters, it fed into a, a cynicism about politics that reduced voter turnout. And we really need high voter turnout for things like getting climate action, for things like animal protection. We need high voter turnout for the kind of progressive changes that we need. And when you feed public cynicism and, and particularly young people think there's no point in voting, well, that hurts democracy. It really hurts democracy. Absolutely. And that, uh, you know, I'm seeing in the chat, so many of us over the years um, have felt like we needed to strategically vote. I mean, I'm not one of them. I resisted the strategic vote. And therefore, I have never had a representative basically on any level of government except for municipal that I voted for, which can, uh, you know, if I wasn't so committed to politics, that would be very disenfranchising. And yeah. so just the idea, I my cat loves you, Elizabeth. <laughs> Okay, but, but I'm realizing <laughs> I've got a portrait of my dog right there, but Aww. she's in British Columbia. I miss Aww, her. That's my that's my little girl too. right there. Aww. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I'm in my parliamentary office. No pup. It looks really cozy there, actually, for a parliamentary it's, office. It's not bad. Not bad at all. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, and so just, you know, that idea of strategic voting. So how does, you know, uh, we're talking when we're talking electoral reform in this case, um, we are more talking about a proportional representation system. Um, how does that affect the whole idea of strategic voting and, and how strategic voting really hurts um, the parties, the smaller parties? that have, you know, some really fresh new ideas. 
Well, the other thing is, I mean, I go back to what happened in New Zealand because I think it's quite instructive. And I've got dear friends who are co-leaders of the New Zealand Green Party. Well, in the, I mean, it's just like, I don't know how many of you pay enough attention to politics know that sadly parties that should be able to cooperate are least likely to because parties are f- afraid and Greens aren't like that because we've never been in that kind of position of thinking, those are our votes. Those are our voters. How dare those other people come along and offer you know, policies that appeal to progressive folks who care about animal rights. We should only have, you know, so the, the, the anger and the elbows out and the meanness that happens in politics is more likely, strangely enough, between like the old conservatives before they kind of disappeared and reform because they think, uh-oh, we're conservatives. Think, those reform people are after our votes. NDPers think those, and those Greens, they're after our votes. Well, they're, they're not anybody's votes. But what happens in, and that's because of strategic voting, everyone campaigns except greens on we're the only good ones don't listen to those 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 are are heretics they're not true believers don't vote for them they're bad people it gets very nasty and very partisan what happened in new zealand and also still happens in england and wales for my green friends there the labor party there like the ndp here kind of wants the greens to be um our place in the political spectrum from their point of view is basically roadkill uh that you know just get out of our way labor in England still is nasty to Greens. Labour and New Zealand, once you got rid of first past the post, you changed the culture of politics. People stopped thinking about strategic voting or the strategy changed totally. So what happened was, like in the lead up to the 2017 election in New Zealand, you had the news because it had by that point been several elections of getting used to the idea that they're voting mixed member proportional. So you vote for what you want not against what you're afraid of. You, you, you vote and it changed diversity. It, for the first time ever, Asian MPs got elected in New Zealand. The number of, of Maori indigenous MPs went way up. But what happened too was cooperation. So in that election, the New Zealand Greens and the New Zealand Labor Party, who was led then by Jacinda Ardern, were able to tell the voters, if you vote for either one of us, we're gonna cooperate after the election. So there, so the, the Labour Party in New Zealand didn't get enough seats to actually form government on their own. But as promised, Jacinda Ardern, with the support of New Zealand Greens, formed government. And then that makes member proportional. The government worked really well. And they made a lot of really good changes. And then, of course, um, and I think very sadly, the New Zealand government just changed. But the New Zealand, New Zealand Greens are still there strongly in Parliament to defend some of those policies. But the ability to cooperate, to come to consensus-based decision-making is so much healthier. And proportional representation fuels that Whereas first past the post fuels the kind of rage farming based algorithms to make people essentially vote a, a, a vote out of fear or hatred or quite, you know, unpleasant emotions drives down voter turnout. Countries that have fair voting have higher voter turnout on average for sure everywhere regardless of all the other things that are going on around them mm, so if yeah. we could cha- if we could change our voting system we would change our culture to one that is much more inclusive one that really works to find consensus so i'm thinking for the next election i'm not quite sure how to express it can't really think okay how do we convince people that what we really want you to do is you know you don't want a conservative false majority you don't want a liberal false majority Vote for the smaller parties, wherever you are. Just get out, protect democracy, and until we get rid of first past the post, make sure you're voting for a party that's going to make sure to hold the the bigger ones accountable. Mm -hmm. Make sure you're voting for a party that you can trust to hold the line to protect planet Earth, to protect species, to protect animals. Just vote for what you want. And don't worry, because if we take enough of those votes for what people want, we can stop the bigger bully parties from forming a false majority and running roughshod over parliament. 
Mm. I love what you said. Um, we want to vote for what we are, what we want, not for what we're against and scared of. Um, that's really what it comes down to. And yeah. Elizabeth, I love, you know, the, with New Zealand, didn't they even uh, um, bring two Green Party members on as ministers? Oh, yes. The they, had four. Yeah. they had four ministers in four. the cabinet of Jacinda yeah. Ardern who were um, cabinet ministers. Yeah. Uh, they did a confidence and supply agreement that included being sitting on cabinet, which is obviously we currently have a confidence and supply agreement in Canada's parliament between the Liberals and the New Democrats, but the New Democrats didn't negotiate to get cabinet seats. Mm -hmm. The Greens in New Zealand did, and uh, they, they brought in a lot of really good changes to legislation over the years. But of course, there's uh, all around the world, there's currently 10 governments around the world that have greens in cabinet because of the way that the uh, fair voting situation creates situations where you have to negotiate with many parties to form government. So the two green co-leaders who ran in Germany in the 2021 election in Germany, it was by the time they, they, they did to negotiate a government where Chancellor Schultz is now the chancellor of Germany, they're the two Green co-leaders are in that cabinet because without the support of the Green Party, that government wouldn't exist. So it's it creates, but it's not just two parties in Germany. So you create coalition governments where different voices are heard, where all the voters are represented. And when you think about regional politics in Canada, it's not a good thing that first past the post creates a situation where there there are some provinces with not a single uh, MP sitting with the ruling party. That's not healthy. You know, there's a lot we could fix mm -hmm. by having fair voting in this country in terms of national cohesion, our sense of who we are as a country that mm -hmm. is really inclusive. Absolutely. We pride ourselves as Canadians of being, you know, compassionate and civil. And that is not what is happening in our political system right now. And I remember, yeah. Elizabeth, in 2015, when the Liberals got in, um, you did an amazing job in the uh, debates, the televised wow. debates. And everybody, there was a big petition, thousands of people signing, saying you should be the environmental minister. And of course, that's not going to happen in this first past the post system. It's just not going to happen. However, you, we see in New Zealand that that absolutely did happen. They didn't have to do that. Like originally they didn't, you know, it wasn't, they probably could have figured out another coalition, but they decided that it was, you, you had, they had common goals. And so instead of uh, these parties that are more progressive, having to go at each other instead of yeah. the big bads, you know, you could work together, right? It's, it's really lovely. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm thing. very grateful that I can work cross party lines in parliament now. I mean, I've been, a, I've been, in bringing in what, so the strongest animal rights bill, I think, well, it's certainly a, a unique animal rights bill because the bill that I brought through Parliament in last session on banning the keeping of whales and dolphins in captivity, and it was Camille Labchuk, who, of course, is um, animal justice, was pointing out, like, it's the first bill ever and one of the first bills anywhere around the world that recognizes that a court has to think about the best interests of an individual animal, not just, you know, species decision, but uh, in, in deciding whether a, a whale, an individual animal or, 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 or dolphin or porpoise should be in some kind of care center, needs to be in a different place than other in, otherwise in the wild. That decision requires a judicial consideration of the best interests of that individual person animal, not just the collective. So to get that passed took a lot of work. Of course, getting people across party lines to support it. And in the Senate, that bill at one point, it went from the Senator uh, from Nova Scotia, who was one of the initial starter of that legislation. And it went, then it went um, to Murray Sinclair, who of course is an indigenous Senator and Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The, the ability to get people to work together from something you really care about, whether it's my bill on Lyme disease or animals or my current bill on environmental racism, to get bills like that passed takes a lot of work across party lines. So it's just my nature anyway. I, I, I'm really happy not to ever say anything mean <laughs> about anybody. <laughs> so, but it's, it, it's um, democracy should work where 
members of parliament put aside whatever political party baggage they carry to Ottawa, set it aside and go to work for the country, for the planet, for the species. I often say that my representation of Saanich Gulf Islands, I represent the human people of Saanich Gulf Islands and the whales and the eagles and the trees. They may not vote, but that's, that's my constituency and I do my best to represent all of the life of that community. It's a lot easier. Boy, it would be so much better if we had a parliament that was all MPs who weren't controlled top down by their backrooms of their parties. And we'd see much more cooperation across party lines if we got rid of the toxicity that is embedded in the culture created by first past the post, which is, as I said, elbows out and kind of mean. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, I think that does turn people off voting, certainly makes people not very interested in politics. Mm -hmm. Well, and so, you know, uh, not only is strengthening our democracy uh, just uh, for a more just and equal society, um, just the right thing to do, um, but for animal activists, you know, here that are already feeling pretty overwhelmed fighting on behalf of, you know, 80 billion farmed animals in this world who are being slaughtered each year, you know, most yeah. of those being in torturous factory farming systems, yeah. not to mention the animals uh, suffering in labs for fashion, for entertainment. So so you've already mentioned a few things, um, Elizabeth, but why is this something that animal advocates should already spend our over, uh, you know, overtax time on? Um, I mean, you might talk a little bit about egg gag law too, you know, which oh, uh, you have been a huge, you've been hugely vocal in opposing um, egg gag laws. I was so heartsick that Mike Morris, who's the, my, right now the only other Green MP from Kitchener Centre, and I were the only ones to vote against that. We felt very lonely on the floor of the House of Commons on that bill. But again, first past the post, just as my story about Nate's bill back in the back in 2015, when you're looking at and you're in politics and you're going to, by the way, every other party besides the Greens whips votes. So all the MPs tend to vote the same way all the time. So what are they worried about? Why would the NDP tell all their members they had to vote in favor of the ag gag law? Why did all the well the conservatives and liberals? Why? Why? Well, and the, the NDP bloc, voted against it, so we need to give not, props to not NDP. on the floor. No, we were. Oh, Mike and I were vote. the only ones. Was so heartsick about it. I think no. If I'm wrong on this, Kimberly, I would yeah, be you very, are. Very, <laughs> Sorry, really? Elizabeth. You they the the NDP when did absolutely they all vote for it. They they they, all they, voted. they voted against the um egg gag bill and and a, just a handful okay. of liberal MPs did um and because I know this well because Animal Justice Academy we fought I'm really sorry, hard. I'm sorry, because no, I thought right. that there was one yeah. day where Mike and I were the only ones who were looking around thinking yes. this can't be right. Oh, you've been we're... you've been the only one to second bills. You've been the only one on a, quite a few things for okay. sure. But this is one that just well we, the main reason. That, yeah. that parties would vote for it would be that the agriculture lobby is in, is enough to influence under first past the post enough riding by riding results that if you could have 50% of Canadians against an ag gag law but if those 50% of Canadians are distributed through enough different ridings, that it won't make a difference. And riding by riding the seat count to win an election requires uh, accommodating that interest group. Mm -hmm. That's why things are so difficult under first past the post that would be um, much more democratic under any system. I know that somebody's put in the chat, there's lots of different ways of doing proportional representation. There's single transferable vote. There's mixed member proportional. There is lots of, um, uh, there are lots of ways of making sure that voting is fair. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but the two, but there's a couple of winner take all systems. It's not just first past the post. There's also ranked ballot, works out as winner take all. But we really do need to have a voting system that allows Canadians, number one, to vote for what they want as opposed to what they're afraid of, to increase voter turnout, and to make sure that s s relatively small interest groups that are well positioned across the country in certain ridings. I mean, 
these so-called wedge issues. I mean, how did Stephen Harper get the first majority government in that he ever had, which was in 2011? He stopped Parliament from fixing the long gun registry. He wanted to keep the long gun registry as a wedge issue. And there were MPs, I think we're good MPs. I'll mention one I liberal, I, I worked with a lot to stop um, the opening up of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge back from when I was even at Sierra Club. Worked with a guy named Larry Bagnell, liberal from the Yukon, really strong voting record on environmental concerns and certainly stopping oil and gas drilling in the uh, breeding territory of the porcupine caribou herd. Anyway, we worked together a lot. He lost his seat in the Yukon because the legal, decent community, and there are, I know it's, I'm sure no one on this call is a hunter, but there are in agriculture, in the indigenous communities in the Yukon, there are people who really hated the long gun registry. That one issue, that's what it means when it's a wedge issue, was enough to mobilize the people in Yukon so that Larry Bagnell, who'd been there for a very long time, lost his seat and a conservative won that seat. That's how slicing and dicing the vote, riding by riding, as opposed to the popular vote overall across the country, that's how specific issues like an ag gag law or becomes a wedge issue or like the gun registry becomes a wedge issue and mobilizes a lot of the voters in a specific area. So it's, I know- Yeah, it's, like brings I, out I, the gun lobbyists, brings out the ag lobbyists. It brings out the lobbyists and, and gives them an out, outsized voice for sure. So that's it. I mean, the first, I mean, trying to connect for the dots for people, and I don't know if I'm doing a good job at all on this, but no, you're doing the, great. The, the elect, the, the, the voting system we use has a big impact on the democracy we get. Mm -hmm. And if we have a voting system that says it doesn't matter if, you know, 60% of Canadians didn't vote for your party, you're going to get 100% of the power mm -hmm. because slicing and dicing the vote riding by riding works like that. Yeah. And so just to give folks a little bit of an idea, those that are new to this issue, um, we say electoral reform, and that's really the first step is, is to be able to examine what's not working about the first past the post system and look at what are the um, best opportunities to move forward. And uh, we talked about ranked ballot, which isn't ideal. It's still a winner takes all still probably a little bit better than what we have, but not proportional, you, you would disagree. Yeah. So I, 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 you know, you're the expert on this. Um, but, <laughs> but I think what we really need to focus on is that what we're talking about here that would really transform things is some sort of proportional representation system of which there are many different forms. Um, yeah. But proportional representation seems to be the one cited, you know, like that's what most assemblies and experts will, will come up with. And so do you have any specific uh, specifics you want to talk about with that? Well, just to say, I mean, if, if, if you, you were saying that the opportunities for Canadians to examine the systems, I discovered, which I hadn't known before when I was on the, um, the standing committee, the special committee on elect reform that was created out of the liberal promise that 2015 is the last election under first past the post. I mentioned the committee already, but when we were crossing the country and we heard from all the experts, I mean, before that process, actually, Kimberly, I probably would have thought ranked ballot was a, a step forward, but mm -hmm. we couldn't find an expert who thought that it was other than just as bad as first past the post. Interesting. But what I didn't know before starting that process was that the first, we were not the first parliamentary committee to study our voting system. The first time it was studied was in, in um, 1921. And that committee found that first past the post as a voting system did not work for Canada. We have never, ever had any study held, whether it's a law, the law commissions or citizens assemblies or provincial reviews at the provincial legislatures or in the federal parliament committee studies or expert groups. No process in Canada ever has found that first past the post works for Canada. And that's because even back in the in 1921, we have had more than two parties. We've never been a two party system. And it's if you have any remote sense that it's going to be okay to have 100% of the power, you have to at least have had 
51% of the vote, but you can have 100% of the power with, as we've said before, 38%, 39% of popular support. It's very anti-democratic. And that's why back in 1921, the, the House of Commons Committee studying the matter said, well, look, there's, I think at that point, there were four different parties sitting in parliament. They're different parties than we have now. I mean, some version of the liberals and some version of the conservatives have stood the test of time, but there have been different parties with different farmer names. And then, then the NDP came along and Greens. Well, actually, so, you, and then reform and all of those parties. So over time, the, the names of the parties change. Bloc Québécois emerged. But we've always had for over a hundred years, three, four, and five parties in our political system federally. So of course, first past the post can't work because if it was designed for anything other than horse racing, it was designed for a country with two parties. Yes. Now the US is hardwired that they'll only have two parties because they hold, they hold elections and for a third party to emerge, you have to get registered state by state separately. It's a lot of obstacles to third party voting in the United States. Then they made their system even weirder with, with the electoral college. Canada's system is again, particularly dangerous because a prime minister with most of the seats in the house of commons has a hundred percent of the power. We do not have separation of powers. So for a Trump like candidate in Canada to become prime minister, that person will have more power than Donald Trump ever had in the White House. The Prime Minister of Canada in a majority government has more power than a Prime Minister in UK or a President in the United States. Relative to the size of our government, the Prime Minister of Canada has more power over the system than Prime Ministers in other countries that are Westminster parliamentary democracies like us. And that's because we got rid of the system where uh, the caucus of elected MPs for the prime minister's party can throw them out as famously happened to Maggie Thatcher replaced with John Major by conservatives in her own caucus or going to Australia, Julia Gillard chucked by her own caucus. We don't do that in Canada. Okay, so that's one difference. The other difference of course is the US had a revolution and they split up and said, okay, we don't trust well, they didn't trust King George the Third. Not not a bad decision. Mm -hmm. Canadians, we 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 are the, <laughs> the our ancestors decided King George the Third may be off his head, but he can't last forever. So we're not going to chuck the monarchy. So we don't have separation of powers in Canada, where the U.S. does because of the revolution. So the U.S. president specifically uh, is under a constitution of written by revolutionaries who didn't trust people with power and wanted to make sure that no one person ever had too much power. So that's why the president of the United States has executive powers, but not power over the legislature, not power over the court. Uh, in Canada, as soon as, as I said, as soon as you've got a seat count that gives you a majority government, you control all of it, except the judiciary, but you control all the lawmaking, and executive functions and treaty making and, and, and a hundred percent of the power with less than 50% of the vote. Again, what happens across this country at the provincial levels where we also have first past the post, it's, it would be wonderful for democracy, be wonderful for action on a whole range of issues. If we were not catering to and dominated by a culture that is essentially um, self-interested, all about getting power, keeping power, and not about what are you going to do with the power when you get it? Or who are you serving? <laughs> Absolutely. And no wonder we haven't been able to get um, a, a proportional representation system because the two major parties, the, the oldest parties um, under the current system, they have no incentive to change the system that keeps getting them into power, right? And fortunately, so. the same thing's true for the NDP because they've been in power in numerous provinces and never changed the voting system. It's on their policy book to change the voting system. It'll be a real test to see, do we get all the votes of all the NDPers and we need to push the Liberals hard for the vote on Motion 86. Yeah. Uh, it was originally, and we this shows also cross-party cooperation because Motion 86 was originally Mike Morris's motion. And then we found that Lisa Marie Barron, who's NDP, 
had an earlier slot to get a vote on the motion. Because it's a private so, member's bill, yes. That's so. right. So it's a, yeah, so it slipped as a, as a motion. It By the way, it's not binding because it's a motion. But anyway, we want to get it passed. So it slipped over. So Lisa Marie took it. So we're all working together to make sure it passes. Mm -hmm. And we're going to need every possible vote. So no matter who your MP is, don't give up on them. Even if they're a conservative, try to convince them that allowing a citizen's assembly to go forward it um, should be okay under their, I mean, by the way, the vote of our, I mentioned that the, the committee that studied this, that voted majority vote for proportional representation, that did include every conservative on the committee too, by the way. Yes. And the conservative party, at least back then in 2017, 2016, 2017, said that under their policies, they didn't have a policy supporting first past the post. They basically took no position on it. We're open to looking at all the evidence. Uh, it'll be interesting to see where they are now under Pierre Poiliev. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's talk about action, uh, Elizabeth. There's some questions that have come up, but we'll talk about action first and see if we have time for questions. Okay. So um, the the National Citizens Assembly on Electoral Reform will be voted on, we're expecting next week, next Wednesday. And so we have exactly a week. Um, uh, Fair Vote Canada has been working tirelessly on this, um, yeah. as well as other organizations. Yeah. Um, but we, as in the Animal Justice Academy, AJAers, I, we're going to ask you, to get on for this last week and help push this yeah. through. Because from what I understand, Elizabeth, this has a really good chance of passing. It does. And it really matters to try. And thank you to AJ Academy. I think it's fantastic that you're partnering with Fair Vote. We really, really appreciate it. So I don't know where you, I mean, how, are, how many of you ever run into your MP on the street? I'm just going to mention that because it sometimes happens, particularly in rural areas, so you're going to run into someone. Grab that opportunity. Say, this really matters to me. Pick up the phone and call their constituency office. There's staff in the constituency office that wants to hear from constituents. And those messages, if they're doing their work, and they should be finding out what their constituents want. So phoning up, emailing. Um, phoning works better than emailing because you really want to get the message in a way that the that the MP hears it. Oh, my own constituents care about this. Oh, wow. So this is one of those things um, to uh, to think about. Where are my opportunities? I've got mm, a week. Where absolutely. are my opportunities? Definitely, even if you're if you if you're feeling up to being um, if you where wherever you live, if you can find out where the constituency office is. Go by, knock on the door, deliver a plate of vegan cookies to the staff and say, we're here because we want our MP to vote for this motion. So try everything you can think of. Here's somebody ran into jug meat at the local food co-op. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> Wonderful, use, Debbie. Never miss an opportunity. Yeah. If you see someone, you, uh, um, uh, bus shelters, If you, you never know. I mean, I take the bus. I'm not sure how many MPs that you're going to run, but never mind. If, if you see your MP, Go up and speak to them. If you can go to their constituency office, if and I'm not sure. I mean, who knows? Maybe you, maybe you're, you're, you're. But I used to say this because now everybody's older, so it's not so much the case anymore. So I used to say, if your dad plays golf at the golf course where you might run into somebody, tell them to please be ready to tell them it really matters to do such yeah. and such. It, it, politics is local. And politics is personal and making, getting a change in how people vote is you never know if your one conversation is going to push that MP into voting for motion 86 when they weren't planning on it. Yes, absolutely. And in Animal Justice Academy, we pride ourselves on recognizing the power of meeting with our political reps. So many folks here have met with their MPs. We're not even asking for a meeting. We're just asking you to pick up the phone and send a very simple message um, that basically says, I would really like you to support um, this motion on uh, the National uh, Assembly, uh, Citizens Assembly for Electoral Reform. We actually have an AJA action brief that um, Ina has put several times in the chat that'll take you all through it even if you don't know who you know your mp is you don't know the contact for their constituency yeah. office we have all of the links for that 
easy. You can do it in like two minutes. That's all it takes. And especially folks, if you live in a, a, a riding that has a liberal or a conservative F MP is especially important. Um, I think we've heard that the NDP are going to vote for it. Uh, we know the Greens are. Um, we've also heard that the Bloc Quebecois is going to vote for the motion. Um, you know, again, never hurts to, to uh, you know, double check and to express that to your MP. Um, yeah. But especially the Liberals and the Conservatives, we need to get over the edge. And especially in rural ridings. If you live in a rural riding, folks, this is a very important piece for you to do. Okay. Um, and Elizabeth, do you mind if we bring really quickly on um, Michelle Clifford from uh, yeah. Fair Vote Canada? Um, Ina, do you mind spotlighting Michelle? Um, because Michelle is involved in the in phone banks happening at Fair Vote uh, Canada and that have been going on for weeks. But in this next week, there are thousands of electoral reform supporters um, that need to be contacted to be able to take this action as well. And so this is an extra bonus action for you folks, uh, AJers, who are really keen. I know a lot of you are already doing this, but to join one of the Fair Vote um, phone banks. So Michelle, can you tell us a little bit about how that works? Yeah, of course. And thank you so much for inviting me to speak here. Um, we've been focusing on this campaign and MPs for months now. It's had a lot of success. Yeah. Uh, NDP, like I said, NDP Green and Bloc are voting in favor, but there's several MPs from uh, Liberals that are voting in favor and a couple Conservatives. Um, so it's not hopeless. We have a really good chance of winning this. Right now we're focusing on, like you said, all of those Liberal and Conservative writings, specifically the rural ones. Um, you can join our phone bank campaign. I'll put the link here. Join it in general. We're also having a phone bank calling party today. It starts at 2 p.m. Pacific, uh, 5 p.m. Eastern. And I know it might sound silly to sit on a Zoom call with people making phone bank calls, but um, it's much more fun to do it with other people than on your own. And there's someone there that can help you with issues. These are not cold, cold calls. We're calling supporters from Fair Vote Canada that have said that they are fine being contacted. And so they're all friendly calls. When they answer, everyone is super happy to hear from you. They'll say, yeah, definitely. I'm going to call my MP. So they are pleasurable calls to make. They're very quick to make. Um, you don't have, it's not complex either. You don't need to know all the ins and outs of the issue. You're basically just calling up and saying, could you call your MP, right, Michelle? Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah. there's, a, there's a script provided that says exactly what it is. You, they, you give them the MP's phone number and their name. If they have any questions you can't answer, that's fine. A lot of us can't answer all those questions. You just send them um, the link or tell them where to go for more information. It's very easy. Um, to give you some stats in the last week, we made 7,300 calls. Uh, there's 90 people making calls in the last week. And so like, even though there are thousands left, I'm confident that we can make all those calls. Um, so it's definitely a winnable campaign. I uh, love it, Michelle. So we put the link in and Michelle put the link in. You can either just sign up. Uh, you don't need to do the one today. If you can't do the one today, then just sign up generally um, and you'll, they'll get you up to speed on when and how and where um, with the link that, um, you know, if you can put that in one more time for us, um, the general phone bank link, that would be amazing. And Michelle, Fair Vote Canada has done so much amazing work in the last um, uh, few months, but also just in the last few years. I, I really admire your work. I, I follow it, respect it. And we thank you so much, um, Michelle, for everything you're doing. Amazing. Hopefully people will see you on the phone bank. <laughs> Yeah, hopefully uh, see you there. <laughs> amazing. Thank you. Um, and uh, Elizabeth, before we wrap up, just a couple of questions that have come up. Um, yeah. Can you just um, uh, let us know, uh, folks are asking, okay, is it going to be all complicated? Like, this is going to get it to the first reading? No, it, once no. we vote for this, it's the Citizens Assembly is going to be done, created, right? Well, or, it is or, a motion yeah. that I mean, yes. it's, okay. uh, it could be, it's really important to get it carried, but it yeah. it won't have the power to force the government to set up a citizens assembly as a motion yeah. but it has enormous uh, clout and i think they will set up mm -hmm. a citizens assembly yes. if this carries uh and getting it passed is as you say it's not legislation it's a motion so it doesn't have to go through first reading second reading debate third reading it doesn't go to committee it passes and if it passes so it's one vote one time that's why it really matters to make the calls over the next week to get it to carry. And it is 
it, it has a chance, which is fantastic. And we're, we're doing everything we can talking to our colleagues in the house. But I'm very grateful for this. So grateful that you would invite me to join um, a AJ Academy to talk about why it really matters to, to and for, for animal rights and animal justice to change our voting system. It really matters because a healthy democracy with any, you know, with justice, a healthy democracy works better for every shared and common value. And it's the narrow special interest billionaire class type issues that benefit from an unfair voting system. Mm. And we do have parties out there in Canada who have strong animal protection platforms, the Green Party, the Animal Protection Party, a smaller group that, you know, if they got traction, there you go. You, you know, Absolutely. one, two seats can make all the difference, right? Elizabeth has shown that, you know, one seat in Parliament can make, she's made incredible changes um, on the political yeah. landscape with one yeah. seat. Um, and so how how incredible that could be. Um, and, and the NDP also have decent platforms platform but you know the smaller the smaller parties that that have amazing platforms that aren't getting traction this is how it can change yeah. so elizabeth thank you so much let's bring us back to gallery view so you can see everybody elizabeth and thank you uh, so much oh it's so thank great you kimberly to... it's a really fun conversation well, i'd love to do anytime you guys are, and if and looking for information please keep me in mind all yeah. of you i know you don't live i mean i, I think i saw somebody say they were in victoria right. i'm not sure yes. where you all are i'm in, i'm not in victoria actually i'm in sydney but people in victoria would know the difference the rest of you <laughs> vancouver island i'm on southern Vancouver Island. Very, very fortunate and honored to represent. Oh, Karen, you're nodding. You're Victoria. Hey. Yeah. So we have a lot of um, Canadians. Oh, hi, Kara. We have a lot of people I recognize on the screen now that we've opened it up. I know, up. right? I'm seeing yeah. everybody now too. I'm seeing, I'm seeing Calvin and Angeline. I'm seeing um, uh, Darren. My bro-in-law is even here. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> you brought you brought a lot of people out today, Elizabeth. Well, and, I'd love um, to I'd love to do this with you again anytime, Kimberly. But again, you. thank you all because over the next week is time to twist arms over the phone. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and try to and move those votes. And I want to see in the chat right now, folks, who's going to take action around um, this motion? Who's going to either um, get in touch with your MP or who's going to volunteer for the food bank? Let's see you all show up here in the chat. There's always a little bit of a, a delay. Ah, oh, there we go. We're, we're starting to see the yeses. Yes, we're going to reach out to the MP. I'm going to do phone banking. I will. Yes, I will. I love it. Calling MT MPs. Thank you, everybody. Elizabeth, um, Michelle, um, Fair Vote Canada, and all of you for showing up here today to learn about it. I hope you've learned a lot. I hope you've taken some, you know, gotten some good takeaways, and I hope that you'll uh, step up in the next week to see if we can push this through. Um, can we give uh, um, uh, Elizabeth a great big AJ? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Thank you for all the beautiful work you've been doing around animals. Well, thank and you for all the work you all general. do. It really matters. Mm -hmm. People who care and get involved and fight for animal rights, it all matters. I mean, talk about one person. I wish Jan Arden was in Parliament. Oh, my I goodness. I know, right? There's, we had Jan there's on a here a few months ago, and she's just, yeah, she is a powerhouse, too. You're right. Yeah. You're right. We we need we need about um, uh, 300 more Elizabeth Mays. <laughs> I just say, we also have, I should mention we also have an animal rights caucus in Parliament across party lines. Yes. So M Michelle Rempel Garner from the Conservatives and Nathaniel Erskine Smith yeah. and I, and I'm trying to think if we've ever had what we, we do hold shared events yes. to promote animal justice issues. Mm -hmm. And so it's possible, um, but it will be a lot more possible it would be be a day-to-day -day event of finding consensus if we could get rid of first past the post yeah amen all right folks well so good to have you all here have a wonderful week let's fight um in a loving way and i'll see you here for our aj lunchtime live in two weeks thank you so much elizabeth thank you michelle have a good one everyone take care bye, bye.